Boom! Hello everybody, my name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio and I'm going to show you guys how to tell the difference between warm and cool colors and maybe even before that, what are warm and cool colors? What is the difference? How do we use them? And how do we use them even more to create space in our pictures, even if you're trying to make abstract paintings? So that's what we're going to be talking about for the next hour, and we're going to be painting together. So if you've got some paints already, now's the time to get them out. Okay, here's my box of art supplies. We have, I did a whole episode talking about what's in this box. Um, that's episode zero, so you can go and watch that if you're curious of what kinds of paint I suggest you get and what kinds of boards or papers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm not going to obviously go through all that today. What we're going to need is, I think we're going to, we'll need at least one of these canvas boards. So probably, um, we'll turn the music again. Wait a minute. So, how is that? Does that help? I saw some people saying they don't like the music at all. Um, I'll put it on for a little bit, and then in the comments, tell me what you think. Should music or not music? I'm kind of open either way. Personally, when I'm making art, I like to have music playing, but I can also understand why it may not be... Um, appreciated by everybody so yeah, blah, 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 paint, uh, paint all over the place you got your painting clothes on right that's I always find I get paint on my clothes that the times I think ah I'm gonna be really clean today I'm not gonna need any paint clothes I'm also trying a different microphone today. It's a wired microphone, so it should require less batteries because if you've seen a few of these episodes, you've probably seen a few times where the battery conked out a few times. So um, I was like, okay, let's see if there's another option. So I'm not charging batteries, constantly worried if it's ch charged or not charged. So this should alleviate some of that problem. Uh, uh, so is the music still a little bit loud? Uh, current delay settings. Mm -hmm. Let me just go into... 
project settings. Okay. Hmm. I see what I've done. I've. I wonder if I close this. Hmm. Ah, I see. I opened up. I'm. I obviously. I teach um, at Emily Carr uh, Art School here in Vancouver, and I was teaching there. So Tuesdays are my longest days, so they're usually the days when my mind is a little bit frazzled. <laughs> Thursdays are kind of my day off. Um, obviously, I'm teaching this, so it's always a little bit. I was. I realized my settings are still for my uh, classroom, and not for this. So things are a little bit different than I normally set them up for my class. So always something a bit different when it comes to technology. Um, okay. Okay. People are okay with the music. Right now, um, if people really don't like it, I'll, I'll get rid of it at some point. Maybe by next episode, or I'll take a look at the comments as we go. My wife and daughter are usually upstairs watching and kind of listening for comments. And if there's ever anything, like, <laughs> disastrous happening, and uh, my wife is able and free to alert me, she usually comes, just like she did, running down the stairs to let me know. Um, obviously a very most important part is some tea or coffee or whiskey or whatever floats your boat. <sighs> For those little breaks where you're trying to remember what you were about to say. <laughs> so, okay. Warm and cool colors. What are they? How do we use them? And, um, okay. So, the way that there's, this is a really complicated idea and a really simple idea at the same time. One of the ways that I think about it is, you know those um, digital puzzles, those computer puzzles where you, you know, they used to come in books, I think it's like the 3D eye, 3D eye puzzles and you, and you're kind of supposed to look at them and somebody's like, there's a dinosaur uh, eating a, uh, another dinosaur but it looks like a bunch of mess on the page and then you kind of look at it and you're supposed to cross your eyes and then it appears. I was one of those persons that took like years. People were like, I swear there's an image there. And I thought it was all the bunch of hunkus monkus, right? And then finally I, uh, I was able to see it. I was like, oh wow, that's so cool. I think, well, a lot of painting is like that where you're like, I don't know what everybody else sees. I don't know how to do this. It doesn't make any sense. And then suddenly it kind of clicks. Now, my purpose as a teacher is to try to help you understand this whole concept as quickly and efficiently and effortlessly as possible. And so I might repeat myself in several different ways and use different analogies. So hopefully something I throw out there sticks so that you have that aha moment that uh, took me like a decade to find, so uh, and lots of fumbling and lots of mistakes. So my purpose is to try to short circuit that and save you ten years of your life. Okay, <laughs> so um, I'm going to show you guys a few things um, on the web here, and I'll bring up my split screen here. Oh. Oh, that's because I'm using my Emily Carr setup here. Okay. Poor girl upstairs. Our daughter is just starting the walking phase. And walking, as all of us know, involves a certain amount of falling. <laughs> unfortunately so um, she's really testing the boundaries of what her legs can do and all that kind of stuff so okay so I'm gonna show you hopefully I can do this okay works 
So what we're looking at, and I've, oh, by the way, I've put the links for all the different websites that we're going to check out there in the image description below. And those of you that are watching live, you'll see those links at the very, very top of the live chat. So um, one of them, uh, where is it? So this video uh, called Navigating Color Space by Robert Gamblin. Gamblin is a uh, oil paint company, or they, they like to call themselves an oil color company that they, anyway, um, they made this really excellent video. I'm not going to show it to you now because then the live stream will go down because YouTube will strike it. But um, this video, I think it's like five minutes long and it does an exceptional job of explaining color space. And it's specific to gambling in their company, but I've shown it to hundreds of students. When I do my classes in person, I often show this video. So I would highly recommend watching this video because uh, I'm going to try to explain most of what's in here, but they kind of have beautiful graphics that are circulating and kind of explain it really well. So I'm just going to kind of skip over that and just tell you that that's encouraged to watch. I mentioned this before. This is a list of color temperatures. So if you're, I, I will take this list with me to the art supply store. I've been traveling and I, and I can't find the paint that I, I have and I want to get a different one. I will take a look at, at these things and go, okay, I'm holding a tube of, like, let's say, I'm not sure if this naphthol comes, oh, here's naphthol red, right? So naphthol red is a warm red. See that right there? Right, which is good, because this is why I got a warm red in my hand. All right, so here's another one. Here is what does this say? Magenta, magenta primary. Now, um, hmm. they they don't list magenta on here, but magenta, by its very nature, is a cool color. It's the it's it's like a pink red. So I'm sure there's probably a magenta in there somewhere. Let's go to primary cyan. Now primary cyan, we're not going to find it in here because that's not the way they would call it. So let's see if they just have a cyan on here. Okay. The closest thing to that that they would that would be this color would be cerulean blue. Cerulean blue is kind of your standard cool blue. All right? Got black and white, and there are kind of warm and cool colors when it comes to black and white, but that's way over our head for this class. So you wouldn't have to worry about that at all. That's like super geeky specific kind of stuff that uh, you, might, you know, I'm sure most artists uh, don't even bother with. Um, ultramarine blue, which is our warm blue. So here it is on the list. And I also have Azo Yellow Deep. I don't think they make an Azo Yellow. Um, so, so anyway, this is not, not everything is going to be on this list. You could also try looking up the paint manufacturer and see if they have a list of what your color temperature is. Now, if you can't find it, how do you identify your the color temperature? Well, we'll get into that, and we're going to do a little bit of mixing today we're going to paint a couple of, of images i think we'll probably fit them all on one picture here unless you want to use two canvases um so which one do i want to show okay that's the munsell stuff so i did quite a lot of searching for color wheels that um we can use this one canva.com kind of show look at all these pop-ups and things um this will work pretty well for our purpose um it's kind of cool all, all of these are interactive too which i think is really important we're going to skip over the, we might come back to that this is another website that i use all the time for my design work because it can help it suggests um different uh colors that you can um, let's say if I, it's been a while since I've used this and I've changed the formatting. Oh, um, how is it? I think I just reload it when I 
I'm not a power user of this website, but what it does is it can help you uh, come up with different color combinations. Let's say just palette, right? So it gives you some different colors that work really well together. This, so I've used this many, many times for coming up with colors. This is the most powerful one of all. This is the, um, by Adobe, which Adobe makes Photoshop and InDesign and Illustrator and Dreamweaver and um, a bunch of different kinds of software that artists and designers use. This is color.adobe.com. And this is a fantastic, you know, usually when you load it up, it looks like this. It's got, actually, let's go to, I mean, this is how it usually loads up. And then you'll see, it gives you the option for all these different types of color combinations. So monochrome, which is all the colors are similar, kind of next to one another, right? So they're different hues, um, uh, um, or they're different uh, variations of, of the same hue, right? So here's See, see how it's like, it's basically all the things that are right next to that color. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, these lists here um, because I wanna get right to the, the exercise. Let's see, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller for this. And I'm gonna put this on I think RGB. So I'm moving. It usually comes up with all these different little arms. I'm gonna move almost all of them except one here, actually. Which one is C? Actually, never mind. I'm just gonna put them all back here. So we're gonna work just D here. I'm just gonna zero these out. at zero, which is right in the middle. Something's not at zero, it's not at zero. Okay, so you see how they're all overlapped there in the center. So what I'm gonna do is, let's get, take one of these out to the edge. So right now, what this is, this is red, green, and blue. Right, RGB is the color system. There's another one called CMYK, which stands for uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key for black. All right, so uh, for because key is is the is the the, uh, the it's for the printing process, and black is usually on on top, which um, helps to. Uh, kind of unify the composition. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into specifics of CMYK and RGB, but what I wanna show you here, the reason why I'm showing you this is to, because we're gonna mix a bunch of this stuff and we're gonna play around with it, is to help you understand. So right now, this is telling us, if this is our red, green, and blue, that when I slide this slider all the way to this side, there is zero red in this color whatsoever right? And that is the quality of a cool color. A cool color has no red or orange in it whatsoever. So it's nice. It's like super cool, which when you think about it, we think of blue and we want to think of like an icy, cool ice cube kind of color for a cool color. So no red whatsoever, right? Um, it's also telling us that here in the blue, the blue's all the way up to the top and the, the green's all the top. We're kind of, it's a little confusing, but essentially no red in there whatsoever. Um, let's maybe do another one, uh, or let's keep the same one. Let's actually, we'll go here, and I'm gonna move this uh, towards 
So we're looking, keep an eye on these numbers right down here as I slide towards the red. Oh. See how I start getting some yellow in here and those numbers starts going up 100 and it's getting higher and higher. Now there's more and more and more red in this picture. And what's also happening is the blue or the green and the blue are, are going down until I have something where it's around here where there's like none of either, right? And that means it's pure, well, so-called pure red, right? So there's no blue in it whatsoever, right? So it's a nice warm red, right? And then as I start going back into here, look at the blue. This is the blue slider, right? And I can even slide this over here as I introduce more blue into that red, it gets cooler and cooler, right? This would be your magenta right around here, so it's cool red. Now, if I keep on going, it's getting purple, right? And that red is starting to disappear until there's no red left, all right? So, and same sort of thing when we look at the yellow. So this here would be um, I think actually let's go to CMYK. So if I move my yellow into the blues, ah, come on, this magenta is at zero, meaning there's zero red in there. So, um, you always, the, the long story short with all of this is your warm colors, the warmer it is, whereas the warmer it is the more red and orange you'll have in your color. The cooler your colors are, the more blue and green you will have in your colors. Now the immediate question that comes up is, but wait a second, I've got a cool blue and I've got, or, or sorry, I've got a warm blue and a cool red. I thought you just said blue is the sign of a cool color and red is the sign of a warm color. So what's going on here? Great question, right? So every color there is has a color temperature and there are, like we've seen, cool and warm yellows, cool and warm reds, and cool and warm blues. So just because a color is blue doesn't mean it can't be, be cold. It just means it's a little bit warmer or cooler on that spectrum, right? As we were looking at this diagram here, right? So if I go back to uh, this here, I'm just going to actually, so we're not even worrying about these numbers. We just can look at the, this diagram, right? As, so here I am in the reds, as I start going towards the orange, right? So this is warm area right here, nice and warm. This area is all warm, right? And we get into this yellow, nice warm yellow color because there's still orange and red in there. And then it gets to a point where it's like the top of a mountain, right? And it's warm, 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 warm. Gets to the top, take one more step, and then we start getting cool again, right? So all of a sudden, when we start going in this direction, there's no red or orange in there whatsoever. It's just getting colder and colder and colder. And as it gets colder, it gets green, right? So then we get green, 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 blue, 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 green, blue, right? Until we get all the way down here to our coldest possible blue, right? And then if we keep on going, that blue starts to get warmer. This thing's flickering. It starts to get warmer and warmer, right? So our ultramarine blue is somewhere in this vicinity. So it's a warm blue. So you got your cold blue and your warm blue. Cold blue, warm blue, right? 
And then as that blue gets warmer and warmer and warmer, it becomes violet, it becomes purple, right? And it keeps on going. And then that purple itself starts to become cold and becomes a cold red, right? And then here's, so here's our magenta, it looks kind of pinkish. If we keep on going, we get back to the warmer red, right? So warm area here, cold, cold, warming up, warming up, warming up, warming up, and getting cool again, and cool, cool, cool. I mean, there's going to be some cool and warm greens in here as well, and then we cool, and then on the mountain peak. So that's I maybe theoretically makes some sense to you when, you when you're like, okay, I think I get it. Let's see this in practice. So how would I, if I go to an art supply store, know what color is warm or cool? Now, obviously you could use that color temperature list to help you out, but the thing you would want to look at is, um, is there any yellow or is there any, um, so let's say I'm looking at this blue and I'm trying to compare which one, let's go to a different view. So if I'm at the art supply store and I want to know which one here is, sorry, come on camera, focus on that. Camera's having a day off or something? What's going on? been overheating it. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. So there we go. So if I had these two colors, and again the color on the screen is not super accurate, but what I would want to look at is which color here has red in it or kind of a red hue or which one has a bit more of a greenish yellow hue, right? So, and we're gonna try mixing these and I think when we start mixing it, it'll start making a little bit more sense. In fact, let's, let's just do, let's start mixing this and I think you will, you'll see. So I'm gonna use some, uh, just a couple pieces of paper to do this. And we'll, we'll kind of learn a little bit about how to kind of play around with our colors. Okay. So I'm just gonna squeeze some paint out on here. That's maybe a little too much. Where did this go? There's a little bit of a color cast on here. So if I if I wanted to figure out what color was what and which one was warmer or cooler, what I would do is just take some color, and obviously you probably can't do this in the art supply store, but with the colors that we have, once you start kind of playing around with this, this kind of stuff starts to make a little bit more sense. Right, so one thing people will often do is kind of do a, a, a strip, a little bit of a line here like that. I'm just gonna get a little bit of this paint off my brush. All right, and I wanna see what happens if I mix some yellow into this color. All right, see this kind of nice lemony color that's resulting. All right, so that's nice saturated bright, luminescent green, right? Almost fluorescent. Okay. And you know what, I'm just gonna 
jump to a different paintbrush here so we can see this color. Let's move this color, this ultramarine blue, right? And then I'm going to take this cool yellow and let's mix a bit of it here. So look at the resulting mixture that is created, right? This one has a bit of like, is a kind of a muddy brown, right? Two, two different blues, the same yellow, but we get radically different result. Like, look at this, right? So this tells me that when I look at this, that I'm mixing two colors that are these two cool colors because I'm getting a nice, saturated, bright color, right? So if we look at the color wheel, the super zoomed in here, right, that we did um, in the previous couple of classes. So this first mixture that I did was essentially these colors here. This second one that I did is this mixture up here. And so I got a significantly different result. And why that is, is this area in the center, so move this off to the side. I'm gonna get paint everywhere today is what we call the neutral core. How do you spell neutral? Is it N-E-U? If everybody spells it wrong, it's my fault. Right, so the neutral core. So what this is, is as colors get closer to the center of the color wheel, they become gray and brown. They lose their saturation. Right, so, and we can see this when we mixed these colors, that these colors, let's say this warm red and the primary cyan, that mixture as it got close to the center is this dark kind of brown color, right? So as colors move away from the center, the neutral core, they get more and more saturated. They become brighter colors, right? So, which is, which, is not there's no good or bad with that it's just which color do you want right so if you wanted to paint the highlights on some grass a really nice bright emerald green would be what you would you might want but you probably wouldn't want to paint all the grass a really bright green you probably actually want a lot of your grass to be quite close to the neutral core I think one of the mistakes a lot of artists make is they paint with their very saturated colors around the outside of the color wheel, these almost fluorescent colors, and they use a lot of that all the time. Whereas, you know, most of the paintings in uh, art history, like especially older paintings, kind of are around the neutral core. Like if you look at the Mona Lisa, for instance, most of the colors, we have a lot of earthy tones, right? So they're gonna be in this area. We have just a little bit of green and blue, which were pretty scarce pigments, you know, 500 years ago. So we would have a lot of colors from here and a few colors from up in here. But there certainly weren't anything this bright in any of those paintings. Right, you look at Andy Warhol's paintings, you know, they're gonna be much more, they're gonna be closer to the outside edge, right? So when we're, we're mixing our colors, you just wanna be kind of mindful of how bright or saturated your colors are and how close they are to that neutral core. Okay. Okay, music is a little distracting. Okay, so let's, um, so again, let's do play around with some of this mixing because I really want everybody to really understand how this works and how you can identify a warm and a cool color. Because this is again, the thing that, that I struggled with for so long is 
how do I identify, how do I even know a color is warm or cool, right? So it, it obviously learning, if you can find the words and you can find out directly from the manufacturer what it is, but if, you know, even if I go back to this uh, diagram here, the, the Adobe Color Picker, um, you know, this little area, like the top of that mountain is pretty tricky. Right, choosing, so if I was to go to the art supply store, I would try not to, p to pick a color that is, you know, really, really hard to identify. Is it warm or, or cold, right? So that's this area right in here where it's, again, it's, again, it's, it's literally like standing on the tip of the mountain and you say, am I east or am I west, right? You're like, uh, it's kind of hard to identify, right? So. Um, that's why I've deliberately chosen colors. Let's say the yellow, the warm yellow I chose was more like this area. And the cool yellow I chose was kind of around here. So that's going to result in an easier way to separate those colors from one another. Similarly, I chose a cool blue that was around here and a warm blue that was around here. So actually that cool blue would be up there. All right, so I'm kind of ignoring a little bit of this area. And then similarly, when it comes to the red, I chose a warm red here and a cool red here. So to help make those, those distinctions easier. So I would personally, because you can also start to, you can kind of mix these colors together to get into this area, right? To get a little bit more. Um, and quite frankly, you're, you've covered 90% of the bases with just the six colors that we have here. All right. Okay. So, um, let's say again, let's, let's use a, a different color here. I'm going to wipe this, these brushes off. I'm going to clean them real quick. Okay, so this is uh, what happens when you have these kind of cheap paint brushes is the ferrule um, comes off. Uh, if I paid $100 for a paintbrush and that happened, I would be very upset. It happens to a, a $2 paintbrush I bought. It's, you know... It's like shopping at the, the dollar store, right? It's like, well, all sales final. Okay, so let's just practice this again with a slightly, let's now try this red. And can we, if, do I wanna go off script and see if I, uh, I was gonna see if I could just pull out a whole bunch of different colors and just randomly put them on here and see if we could identify them. That would, you know, maybe I'll do another video about that. Gets, this is kind of, this is both like really geeky stuff, but also like the most essential information when it comes to painting that I can imagine. Okay, so is this color a warm or a cool red here? Darken that down a bit. So again, I can test it by using a few different colors that I that I do know are warm or cool. So I've got, I know this is a cool yellow and I know this is a warm yellow, All right? So what is the result that I'm gonna get from here? So if I mix, let's say this warm color here, I'm gonna get this brighter result, kind of a very saturated orange. Okay, now we'll just clean that brush and let it sit in there just for a second while I paint. Now, this is going to be a little bit different. It's harder to identify these oranges as much as the greens and the violets, but let's, I got this cool yellow. Let's mix some warm red in here. Hmm. Now, and there's a little bit of, you could see a little bit of blue in here which isn't going to help me much. It could be. 
So let's see, I put some of this yellow and red here. Now, both of these colors are giving me a pretty good result. They both look pretty orangey, right? So is this gonna help me identify whether it's warm or cool or not? Mm, maybe not, right? Because if we go back to this scale, the oranges are pretty stable, right? These oranges on the outside of the color wheel are close to the, to the other ones here. So maybe adding yellow to the mixture isn't the best solution to identify whether this is warm or cool or not, All right? So let's try a different route. Let's mix some of the different blues with this red and maybe we'll see a different result. Okay, so I've got this red. Let's mix some of this blue together. Hmm, this is the color I'm getting. Not a bad result. All right. Okay, let's put this brush down. Now let's take some of this red. So this, this color I got here, it's not as saturated as maybe I would like it to be, but it's still kind of a crimson red. This, again, it's hard for you to really see on the monitor, or at least what I'm looking at. Um, but it's not, it's not bad, it's just not a super saturated color. So let's take some of this cool blue and mix it into the mixture. Okay, now look at this one. See how it's like significantly more um, darker of a color? And it's almost kind of like a brownish um, color. And the reason why is, let's bring back our color wheel. This is why it's super helpful to do this exercise, right? So what we were doing is we were mixing this warm red with both of these blues, right? So we saw, the last mixture I just mixed, right, was the cool blue and the warm red. And that took us as close to the neutral core as possible, whereas the warm red and the warm blue took us a little bit further away. If we wanted one of these a little bit more saturated purple violets, then we would have wanted to mix the cool red and the warm blue to get right in here. Okay, so, the way that we can determine the temperature of the color is by mixing it with other colors, right? Because that, because basically, I, I, maybe another way to think about this is the way that you you get um, the the way the reason why colors start to approach the neutral core is because they contain a little bit. Of, of blue, yellow, and red in them, right? So these colors stay very saturated on the outside edge because all they, so let's, so for instance, the these greens are really saturated because all there is is yellow and blue in the mixture. There's no red in there whatsoever. So nice bright color, right? The minute we start adding a little bit of red into the mixture, right, as we do here with a warm yellow or a warm blue, the color starts to, to get more and more brown, right? So how do we mix a brown? We add a little bit of each color together, right? So let's, let's just mix a brown. So I take my warm red Right? And I can mix, let's say, a warm brown by also taking some warm yellow. And so I get this kind of warm orangey color. Now, I can make this a, a cool brown or a warm brown depending on which blue I add to my mixture. Right, So let's say I'm going to add a little bit of warm blue to this. Right, and You can see how quickly it changed. 
right? But now we've got this, this kind of, um, what, what color would I say that is? It looks to me, it's kind of like a, a muddy red is the way, not quite brown. Well, it is brown, but it's, um, and it will get more and more darker the more blue I put into it, obviously. And the more kind of each of these, so let's say I add a little bit too much yellow in here. You see it's kind of turning, uh, I guess you can't, that's the one thing with doing this over the internet. You can't quite, so this is now a greenish brown, right? Versus, let's take some of the warm red warm yellow to get this orange and I'm going to add a little bit of the cool blue into here and I'm going to get a much darker color and it's going to be a cool brown All right so your colors are going to turn more and more brown and darker and darker the more you have all three of the these so-called primary colors in there okay so i don't i don't know if anybody was painting along with me and testing these things or just watching but let's now put all this into practice and we're going to start actually painting and i'll show you how using warm and cool colors we can create depth in our images So let's, I'm going to move this piece of paper. Maybe I'm going to use this as maybe my palette for today. Cables, cables, cables everywhere. Every song sounds like a Peppa Pig song. Uh, that's basically all I, I watch these days is Peppa Pig. Because uh, of our daughter. <laughs> so, okay. Um, we're going to do an exercise here. It's going to use um, warm and cool colors together. And then um, in the next couple of classes, we're really going to we're going to start painting with all of these colors. We're going to put all these lessons together. So let's take this canvas. Maybe I'll do it this way. And I'm going to divide it in half. Now I have a kind of a ruler here. I could cheat with it, but. What I'm going to do is just, it doesn't have to be perfectly in the middle. It doesn't have to be straight either. I'm going to draw a line right down the middle. Okay. And do I want to do four of these? I think we only have time to really do two of them. So, and that might just get too complicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a ball on a surface here. So I, I have done the, I'm just gonna draw a little bit darker than you maybe want to, just so that everybody can actually see what I'm doing. Again, your paint might pick up some of this color, so we just wanna be careful not to draw too dark. Okay, so here's, because we're going to contrast these two images together. So this is going to be a ball on a table. And I'm going to draw this a line going right through. Again, it shouldn't be that dark. But so once I got that, I'm going to do a little bit of erasing. You know, one thing that you might want to think about doing is, you know, if you're going to do a lot of drawing on a canvas, what I often do, or I have done, is draw, and then when you're ready to start painting, you just take your eraser and kind of just gently, you're not erasing, trying to furiously erase everything, but you're just sort of taking some of the darkest parts off of the image, if that makes any sense. So you can still see it there, but it's less likely to really interfere with your colors as you paint. Okay, 
Um, maybe I uh, let's just do that for both of these just a little bit. Okay. So, and and these, by the way, what I'm doing is, um, I'm I'm kind of replicating some exercises that I've done in a, in a previous couple of YouTube videos where I talked about color temperature and there were very fast snappy videos that I made animations to and I'll put the links for those in the video description below and those videos have like I don't know, 100,000 views and they're very popular and so today what we're doing is, is I'm kind of just slowing those videos down and giving a little bit more context for how those things are done. So maybe afterwards, or if you're really, if you find this too boring, you can go watch the one that's like the hyper speed edit. And you can find those things on my YouTube channel. I think it's one of the most viewed videos that I have out there. So what we're gonna do is we are going to, let's see, I'm gonna put a little shadow on this side here. So it's kind of a little oval here. It's gonna be a darker area. And a darker area here. So, um, on this one, I'm just going to try using warm colors. And this one I'm going to use warm and cool colors to help create more depth in the picture. So you'll see how this works. And I think, I might need to bring out. So this, by the way, this is again my palette that I've got in this special container here. And as you may have recalled, so this is like a sponge inside of this box, right? I got this wet. So rather than washing my palette off last week, I just, this is, if you look at the same video, this is exactly the palette I haven't done anything to it since last class. And it, all of the paints I can still see are nice and shiny. It's like I never walked away, right? And that was, you know, what, f five days ago, four days ago that we last worked together. So that kind of shows how effective one of those little containers can be in preserving your palette. Because, you know, I have the fortune of having a studio that I can literally just leave everything like this, walk away, go for a walk with my daughter, or come back two weeks from now and everything's in the exact same place. I'll, I would say probably most people watching this video at the end of class have to pack everything up, put it in the garage, you know, because that's maybe your dinner table or your desk or, you know, um, maybe you're painting on your bed or something and you're gonna sleep there in a few hours, right? So uh, anyway, so here's my palette. And if I go back up here, just I'll walk you back through. It's a little bit messy. So this is my warm yellow, my cool yellow. In fact, I think what I'll, I'll I'm going to make some little labels that stick out here. Maybe I'll even do it during the class here as a, during the break or, or not a break, but as while I wait for people to catch up. So Anyway, sorry, my <laughs> warm yellow, cool yellow, warm red, cool red, cool blue, cool blue, and warm blue. All right, so it's the same thing as my color wheel. I try to use the same kind of strategy when I'm doing these so that it just makes it easier. So I don't, sometimes if I do everything backwards or put things in different places, I get confused. So. It uh, helps to be kind of consistent when you do this. Oh. Put this ice pack up here so that that camera doesn't give out on me. Okay. So, and you know what? I think we're going to use a little bit of black today. Um, just so we can see the difference between um, adding black to a color versus using just color to a color. I think, do I, is this, do I, do I wanna do this? Maybe not, maybe not, <laughs> now that I think about it. Cause we're gonna, so next class is, is, is all about black and white and gray. So 
maybe I was getting ahead of myself. Okay, so let's um, what? Let's uh, paint this ball right here. Let's just paint it all red here. And it doesn't matter if it's a little bit sloppy. It doesn't matter if it's a little bit lopsided. Oops. Dipped my paintbrush in the wrong red. I don't know which happens. Let's see. I'm just going to move this here. Now let's maybe, I'm going to brighten it up with a little bit of a highlight here. Again, we're not going to use any, um, uh, any white or black. So I have to use just the colors I have on my palette. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to add, let's say a tiny bit of orange here kind of as a little bit of a highlight on this ball. Hmm. Might have to use more just so it shows up. And you see how I just went and just blopped it right onto the painting rather than mixing it. This is kind of how I like to paint. I like having it a little bit wet. So I can kind of then take that and try to blend it into the painting. Right, and if it's not mixing, if if I have all that paint on there, it can be a bit of a problem. So I'm just going to wipe it off onto this rag, and then just take my brush and kind of push it some of that color around here, rub a little bit off. And this you is easier to do when the paint is is wet. Once it dries, it's very hard to, to mix. I'd have to just kind of paint that orange right over top of it. I won't be able to mix those colors together. So I've got warm red with a little bit of warm yellow into that mixture. Now I'm going to put some warm blue into the, into the side here of the ball. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this warm blue, warm red some here. So this is the darker side of this ball. All right, so I'm trying to create the illusion of a sh of kind of depth and shadow here. brush things out and then I'm just you know every once in a while just sort of clean my brush off you notice I'm not washing it off I'm because I don't need it all off I'm just kind of taking this and now I'm kind of bringing a little bit of paint back into here and you we can spend hours really trying to do this perfectly accurately that's not really the purpose of this exercise so right now that looks pretty, oh, see, <laughs> the top of, I don't know if this is the same brush or what, but, uh, you know, if, if you're finding, I, it's personal, does that, it doesn't drive me nuts that that happens with this, this cheaper brush, you know, if I want, uh, as long, assuming this is nice and, and, that should make it stay on a little bit easier. Obviously, you want to do that with paint that's not toxic. Otherwise, that would be a big problem. Okay. Now I'm going to put a shadow down here, and I'm just going to use the same thing, the warm blue and the warm red. I'm pretty much going to paint this entire painting with just two colors, or I guess three with the warm yellow. So let's get a little bit more of this warm blue in here. Create this shadow. Okay, 
So, there we've got, you know, a ball with the shadow on it. And to be honest, we're going to do something very similar to the one below here as well, but I think we're, we'll mix that as we get to it. Now let's say we want to paint the table and the background. So I'm going to I'm going to upgrade to a little bit bigger brush to get some of this. Let's say I'm going to use one of these flat brushes because I got a little bit, quite a lot of area that I want to cover here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put warm red up front. And then as I go back, it's going to get, um, it's going to get like it turn into a, a darker red like that. So let's start here. Notice how I didn't even put any water on my brush at all. All right, because there's water in the paint already. All right, so this is the same red that I used as the base of that ball. So I'm just kind of inching it up and maybe if you see how we'll zoom in for a second to see see how I'm painting up close here. So to kind of get these lines, I'm just taking my brush and going right up to the edge right up here. Now I might have picked up a little bit of paint from there, so I'm just going to rub the top layer of paint off. Because I don't want any of that dark color kind of getting smudged all over the place. Alright, so same thing. Going right up, what we call like kind of cutting. Alright, so I'm just going to brush a bunch of this paint in here. Now, obviously, if I was doing this over from scratch, I would have a different approach to how I would fully paint this, but this is just our exercise. So, because we'll see when we paint uh, the Matisse um, painting and next week, we'll, we'll have a very different approach for how um, to do that. And you could then go back and, and repaint this, but this is again, just a little quick exercise. So this, I've now got a fully red background. Now obviously, or the table's red. Now it's a little bit confusing with this, um, this ball being right in front of it, right? So I'm gonna add a little bit of darkness to it. So I've got that color already kind of mixed here. So I'm gonna take this color and just put it on the top. Right in on top there. Right, I'm just slowly kind of blending it in. Let's see, I'm kind of pulling away to the edge up here to try to give it a nice, nice clean so I don't see some of those brush strokes. Let's do that on the opposite side. Too much, but 
Let's make it work. Okay, I'm just going to rotate this, which is handy to be able to do. See, there's a little bit of. I'm just gonna go back and kind of touch that up a bit. Now, again, there's if we were, you know, later on when we're doing some other paintings, we're gonna do a, a better job of this. Let me see, maybe a little more blue into here. Um, and I'll really kind of show you the proper way to do. A, a ball like this. This is just really to sh so we can play around with the color and um, learn about color temperature. So this may not be the kind of thing you're going to hang on the wall. Okay, so now we've got this ball on the table. Now we're just going to paint this background and I'm going to paint um, it mostly blue. So I've already got this warm blue mixture. I'm just going to start throwing it right up top here. And so you can see it's got a little bit of red in there. I didn't wash my brush. That's okay because this is just going to be a really dark area anyway, right? And that little bit of red that was on my brush is going to make this color really dark. I think maybe one thing I might do as I go forward is I might take photographs of these, the final versions, and post them to the Facebook page so that you can kind of see how they uh, and compare yours to mine. Just because the video is certainly not going to compare quite as, as favorably to, or the quality of the of this video is probably not going to capture the nuances of the color very well. Because I can already see on the screen, the preview screen I have this. Okay. There, I'm just going to flip this around. It's kind of like washing <laughs> or, you know, squeegeeing the window of your car, right? Trying to get these nice, clean brush strokes. Um, part of the problem is that this is still really wet. If I was to paint that background later at a different time, I'd probably be able to get a little bit uh, of a cleaner quality. I, I would be able to, that's right. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, so here I am treating this like it's a masterpiece and just spending way too much time on it. But maybe that gives people who are painting a little bit slower an opportunity to catch up. So that's one way of doing this. And, you know, this would be if you only had one red, one blue, and one yellow, that would be. The amount of that would, and you don't, you're not painting with a black or a white, which is, uh, or at least the impressionists didn't use black. 
used a lot of white but not black this that would be kind of your the limit that you would be able to achieve so let's kind of blow your mind a little bit and we're going to go down here and do this again but this time we're going to introduce warm and cool colors to create more depth in our picture because right now we just have warm colors in here so every so there's a level of flatness to that image that we're going to to change below here so let's we're going to paint this we're going to do basically we're going to start the painting in the exact same way um, it means i need a little bit more warm red okay Take my warm red, I'm just gonna throw it right in here. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. Maybe I'll just use a slightly smaller brush to add some of that highlight on top there. Get some of this warm yellow. Let's put this warm yellow highlight up top there. Keep on adding a little bit more into the middle. So adding in even more. And then we'll blend it out. You know, certain painters like Van Gogh would leave it like that, right? Allow these brush strokes. In fact, do I want to do that? Do I... We're going to be painting a Van Gogh shortly, but Van Gogh, you know, famous for allowing the brush strokes to remain there rather than trying to hide the brush strokes. He kind of allowed them to remain there as kind of part of the evidence of the process of making the picture. Um, okay, so now let's put, we're going to put a little bit of that darker blue shadow down here, or on the, the bottom of this ball. It did go a little bit darker than I did before, it's okay. If I've gone a little bit too dark, I'm just going to add, take a little bit more blue and bring this back into my mixture and kind of try to even it out and spread it in here. You could spend hours <laughs> fiddling with that. Um, now let me do the shadow on the table real quick. So I'm sure a bunch of you are like, uh, isn't this what we just did? What's the difference? Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there, I promise you. So I'm just going to put this shadow, just like I did there, down here. Again, these are all... So far, all I'm using is three different colors. Warm red, warm blue... And warm and a tiny bit of warm yellow for that highlight. Okay. The ball looks like it's flying a little bit, so I'm just gonna make this shadow get a little bit closer to the ball. Shadows tell us where things are in space. If the shadow wasn't touching the ball, we would assume that that shadow, that the ball was floating above the table, right? 
Okay, now I'm going to start kind of doing some fun stuff here. So we started with, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to go from warm red to cool red here. And then we're going to, in the background here, we're going to go from warm blue to cool blue in the background. So we're going to do a little bit of blending with two different color, two different reds and two different blues. Uh, or I guess I can use this warm red here. So I'm going to again continue like I did the first one. No change. These are identical compositions up until this point. So I've just maybe painted them a little bit differently, added a little bit more color here and there, but essentially they're the same. Another thing too, if you're doing a little bit of this blending that I tend to do a little bit is um, I kind of just allow a little bit of the, you know, my paintbrush is, is still a little bit wet. I'm just going to brush it out. Just brush this dry brush, you would say, out there. So this is, because I'm going to paint some uh, cool red over top of this now. Okay, so I got my warm red. I'm going to add cool red onto my brush. All right, I'm going to take this cool red. And I'm going to apply it here and here. Hmm. It looks great <laughs> with my eyes, but in on the video, it's less hard. It's much harder to see the uh, transition here. Hmm. So I'm just going to take it and I'm blending it down, basically. I don't know what your television or computer monitor looks like, but it uh, on on the TV I'm looking at in front of me, it looks basically the same. So that's frustrating for a painting class, where we really want to be able to see those differences. Hmm. But if you're if you're following along and you're doing it, you're going to start seeing some difference. Right, because I've got this cool red, which always is going to appear to be further away from us. So cool colors recede, warm colors advance. So that's why we always want to try to put the warmest colors closest to us and the cooler colors further away. I wonder if I darken this just a bit. Ah! Oops. That was the exact opposite button I wanted to turn. Anyway, I'm just going to keep on going forward here. So these two reds, and now I'm going to do some cool blues in the background. Um, just looking f uh, at some of the comments here. Um, usually, would you paint the background and the table first? Great question. So, um, it kind of depends on the style of art, and we're going to talk about that um, as we go forward because there there are some artists that would put a, a kind of do what we call like an underpainting down first and then paint over top of it. Um, and then there's some artists that would just paint directly like this. There's no right or wrong way, but certainly doing an underpainting might help, might ultimately make the painting go faster. Um, it seems like it, it seems like when you do an underpainting and let's say you paint the table and, and the, the ball and everything first really, really quickly, and do like a or a wash. You kind of end up having to wait for it to dry, but then later on you can paint much faster because everything's been sort of covered, right? And you don't get these little areas like this where there's a little bit of the white of the canvas showing. 
It's a great question. Um, and the answer is you could, or you, if you don't have to, if you don't want to, but it might help. So now I'm just going to take some cool uh, blue. I'm going to put this cool blue in the background. And I'm going to brush cool blue up top here. And this is going to help push this background backwards. So I'm just getting a bunch onto the canvas here. So this is the first um, instance of cool blue on this picture. So I don't know if you can see what I'm, I'm doing here. Maybe I'll do I'll zoom in again. Just so you see, ah, look at that color cast driving me nuts. Okay. I think that's the auto color, uh, auto color temperature of my camera. I, I should have set to manual. So more things that I got to do. Um, but so it's kind of darkening the picture unnecessarily. So I'm just taking some paint, putting it on my brush, and then kind of, as I get up close here, I'm just kind of poking it in, rubbing it around. And that helps kind of fill in some of the gaps and the weave of the canvas here. Okay, so this is basically a dry brush now because I'm gonna put some warm blue into the mixture shortly here. So I'm going to take, there's my, oh, I got lots of warm blue from the previous exercise. Let's just glop that on here. So I'm going to take my warm blue, I'm going to put this down, oops, let's zoom back in. Again, it's not showing up very well on the screen, but if you're doing this on your own, you should see a bit of a difference between these two colors. Here's my warmer blue moving up into a cooler blue above it. Okay. Now, currently, this is darker than this because they're slightly different just in terms of the way those colors behave so I, if i like the way this looks i could darken that background and i can darken it by adding a little bit of so i've got my cool blue i'm going to add a bit more of this here cool blue I'm just gonna add a little bit of cool red to it as well. So this is gonna darken the color and keep it a dark, let's, let's mix it right here. It's gonna keep it a dark color. So. so it's kind of like right now going into like a dark deep violet.
kind of liked it the way it was before, but you know, if you once you've done it and you know how to do it, you can always paint it again. It was kind of nice with that kind of blue just disappearing into the kind of the lightness of it, but. Um, you know what, I feel like I want to make this even darker, because this is the warm blue and we're going up to cool. So I'm going to add a little bit of cool yellow to this mixture, which is going to turn it into a, a much darker, cooler, um, brownish blue. You can also see what's happening is because the the bottom layer of paint is still a little bit wet, you can see it's picking up the the paintbrush strokes are kind of getting a little bit dark. And that kind of drives me a little bit nuts. That would disappear if I was just using if I waited for the background to dry, which wouldn't take very long with acrylic paint could take 5 minutes maybe. If you have a hair dryer and you kind of put a little bit of warm air on it, that would change, help things along. I'm also going to just take this same dark color and go into my shadow on the table. And kind of just darken that. I'm also just going to add a little bit of this onto the back side of this ball. If you're finding this and any of the other classes I've done useful, I'd very much appreciate a like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you find out when the next episodes are. Um, and if you'd like to support the channel, there's a link to PayPal uh, where you can leave a small donation or a large donation. However much you want to give is always greatly appreciated. Um, and I did have somebody send um, uh, some money last, right after last class, or actually between classes, because there's not everybody's watching the class live, right? Sometimes people are watching um, the episode a couple days later or weeks later. So, and I'll, I'm gonna post um, or acknowledge those people who are contributing um, via PayPal, I'll post a little thing for next class. Ha. Okay, so you see what's happening. Just this is driving me a little bit nuts. What's happening is the paint is still wet, and be, what I'm doing is I'm ending up picking up some of that pigment as I go, and it's kind of creating this little bit of a. So I, what I should do if I was a little bit more patient is wait for this area to dry before I continually try to rework it and fix it. Because it's probably just gonna get worse and worse and worse until that area is dry. So, unless I, I kind of load it up with lots of, if I get it darker. Ah, I don't think I can. Well, let's see, let's just, so this is what often happens when you're painting, is you start kind of obsessing over an area and trying to so-called fix it, and you just make it worse. But I'll make, I'm gonna try to make as many mistakes as I can in class to recreate the ones, the most common ones that people are faced with. You see, I just kinda used a cloth to wipe away the bit of as much of the problem as I could. And let's see, what did I have here? Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, this is just gonna keep getting more and more muddy 
as I go. You can see these brush strokes highlighting. Ah, uh, my goodness. So this is when a painting is telling you to walk away. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how it looks to you guys, but this kind of stuff drives me nuts. So that's why it's good to take a break and have a sip of tea. <sighs> okay. Um, again, th this the point of this exercise isn't really to talk about how to blend and shading. It's really about learning how to use warm and cool colors. And I apologize that the monitor doesn't seem to be picking up the difference as well as I see it. But we have warm colors in the foreground. And as I go, it gets cooler. And then I got some warm blue. And then it's getting cooler as I go up here. And so what I'm trying to do is show you the difference that this one down here has more volume. It just looks like there's more depth to it. Right, whereas this one still looks a little bit kind of flat, right? It just doesn't have that same space that this one does because I'm using the warm and cool colors to help create that, that depth because our eyes just naturally see warm and cool colors um, in different spaces. In fact, how about I just make is this insane if I just do another quick painting in about five minutes here? Um, I'm going to... I'm going to insult every Mark Rothko fan out there by trying to do something. The good thing with these canvases is that this cost a buck. One dollar at the dollar store, right? So. If I'm not happy with the painting afterwards, then, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I have more, ch I have, there's, there's more money in my couch cushions than there are in, in my hands right now. So let's, who, so let me see, I'm just gonna show you guys this guy, Mark. Rothko. I don't know if you're familiar, if you've heard of him, but he's an abstract expressionist painter, American painter who was a friend um, and peer of Jackson Pollock, both American artists who um, probably born 18, well, probably maybe 1905, I'd say, to like, let's say 19. Well, Jackson Pollock died in the late 50s of a car accident. He got drunk and drove and smashed to a tree. And his buddy here, Mark Rothko, killed himself in the late 60s. You know, not the, you know, the, the most um, uplifting characters in art history, um, kind of both depressive figures. But anyway, his paintings are we call like color field paintings, abstract paintings, where he was really using color to create atmosphere. Uh, let me just show you a room. Here's Mark, the Rothko Chapel in Texas. Is this beautiful, let me see if there's an exterior of it. This guy, not happy with the, um, in, so here it's this building on the campus of like, the University of Texas or something. Um, and then inside are these gigantic paintings and um, they do all sorts of different kinds of religious services in there. I believe it's non-denominational anyway. Um, but there's, they have music and concerts in there. And some people, you know, have these, you know, uh, religious experiences in front of these paintings. Me, I, this is not the kind of art that I'm attracted to. I remember seeing uh, his retrospective I think it was at the Whitney in, in New York um, and just feeling like this feels a little bit like uh, an inside joke that I am not in on, right? Because I just like all these people were falling all over themselves 
in love with these paintings and I just was like, I don't know what people see. Um, I understand as I've gotten older why people appreciate them. It's kind of nice, you know, not being bombarded with images and we live in a world where there's literally advertisements, television, things on our phones constantly shouting at us. So seeing something that is just pure color does feel like you know, all of a sudden our minds can kind of drift off, right? And it's sort of like just looking at the ocean. Um, so I, I, I can see why some people would really appreciate that. Anyway, uh, let's just dive off the deep end and show you kind of how, so a little bit of warm and, and cool colors in action. So I'm just gonna take some cool red directly putting it onto the canvas here my brush is it's a little wet so just gonna brush this out so I don't know how it's showing up on your screen this is like it's like a pink color this magenta um, so you ideally that's the color that you would see here and I'm gonna go let's go right to the edge I'm not recreating a specific painting of his uh, right now um, I just want to do a quick example. And I'm sure I have a few friends uh, that are, you know, disciples of Rothko uh, who would be aghast at me trying to, to paint a Rothko in, you know, two minutes here. But, uh, and I, again, it's not going to show up so well on the screen, but... Again, I'll try to take a photograph of this afterwards. So I've got right now this um, cool yellow, or cool red, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so I have to back that up just a little more. So this is my cool red. Now I'm gonna paint some warm red inside here. I have a feeling it's not gonna show up at all on camera. Um, just to, to help kind of illustrate a little bit of the difference here. So, This is how Mark Rothko would spend hours working on one of these paintings. Let's try and get, get it to look just right. Now, what I'm trying to show, and I don't know how well it's going to turning out on your screen, but since this is the warm red surrounded by the cool red, you should see there should be some kind of oppositional thing happening in that this color when I look at it right now, it seems to be just a little, it seems to come towards me while this seems to go back into space. So there's this push-pull effect that um, uh, was, um, is kind of the, the main, you'll, if you hang around painters enough, you'll hear people talking about the push-pull of different colors pushing back and forth. So it's a super subtle, maybe if I hold it up, does that help? Is that the light that's causing that weird reflection? Um, so that the cool color wants to go backwards where the warm color wants to come forward. You can also try it with a blue, but... Um, in fact, well, I, I probably want to wait till this dries, but let's say... I'm gonna take some of this cool blue. I'm gonna paint that up into here. Then I'll contrast it when it's dry with the cool, with the warm 
blue. Okay, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll wait, I'll let this dry rather than me trying to do any more work on it. I'll, I'll wait until next class and, I, and I'll paint the, the warm blue beneath it and you'll see that little bit more of a contrast between here. That's just a quick little side detour into how these colors work. Again, I'll post the link to the previous video that I did on color temperature where I have some animations where you can really see this uh, effect in action. So I'm just going to look over some of these comments. Yeah, so Peter says, I find it a little difficult to tell the difference between the cool and warm red on my screen. I can clearly see the difference between the yellows and the blues. Yeah, I don't know what it is about. I think it's what it is is my camera has the auto... Um, uh, color temperature setting on there so it's adjusting to the light and trying to make it, it's it's struggling to make this to reconcile these two colors so um, I should have thought of that I, I've been meaning to adjust that now I really have to so anyway that's that explains that um, oh Peter's painting along so you can see the difference just gonna look through some more comments here Tiger Rouge says, Tiger Rouge Blitz says, don't forget to smash the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks for the tip. Um, I'm hmm, not sure what you're talking about, the, the mini figurines. Um, Oh, also, I'm just kind of curious. I'm using, as I said, a different microphone, different lapel mic. So I'm curious if the sound is any better or different or worse than some of the previous episodes. Hopefully, it's either the same. Uh, probably not better because this is a $50 microphone compared to a $250 microphone. If it's better, that would be awesome. Um, uh, that would be a good use of my money, but I don't expect it to be, but um, just for my convenience and so it doesn't, when I'm doing these two hour long painting sessions, I don't want it to um, affect things. And another thing too that, might, that is probably causing a little bit of the difficulty is we're painting with both, with, with our colors that are wet. And when the color, when acrylic paint, when it's wet, is very shiny and that shine can um, also affect the colors quite dramatically. So you may have noticed your paintings looked different when they were wet than when after they dried, right? When they're wet, sometimes even noticing these differences can be like, let me see. Like this here is my, my cool red and my warm red side by side on this canvas. And same thing, cool and warm doesn't quite show up on the screen very well but that's a, a tech issue that I'll try to sort out over the next week so on um, I'm gonna start winding up on the on our next class on Thursday what we're gonna do is we're gonna paint a value scale and we're gonna so we're gonna start introducing our white and our black to the mixtures and we're gonna mix a gray and we're gonna see how the, those, our colors change when we add white and black and gray tints, tones, and shades, as, as it's called, to the colors. And why you would wanna use them and when you don't want to use them. Because, as I said, the Impressionists, like probably one of the most famous um, art movements of all time, didn't use black or if they did very, very sparingly. If So um, why did they make that choice? And so we'll look at how black changes a color, what it does to the color when it changes it. It doesn't just make it darker and white doesn't just lighten up a color. 
They're doing a lot of other things to the painting and it's important for you to know what those changes are and to understand that there are different ways. If, if all you want to do is darken or lighten a color, there are other things, other options available to you um, besides adding white and black and gray, right? That's really important because a lot of people don't really fully understand and they just reach instinctively for the black and the white. And, and most people don't even think about even adding gray to the mixture too. So that is going to be um, another really important lesson. And then from there on in, after this week, we are going to spend the rest of these 40 sessions painting paintings together. We're going to be making some paintings based on paintings that already exist and painting some new paintings as well. So it's really important for us to do these foundational exercises and understand the real basics of how color works so that when we start painting our paintings, we'll have a common language that we can use um, and you'll already kind of, and even if you, there's probably a few of you who are watching right now are like, I kind of get it, it kind of makes sense, but and these exercises kind of work. Well, when we start actually painting some of the paintings and you see it in action, that's when, again, that when I use that 3D puzzle analogy, right? That's when all of a sudden you start, you're like, mind bomb, right? I was like, oh, I get it. Now this is why we did all those silly exercises, you know, last week or a month ago. Now it finally clicks in why it's working. So I promise you there's a method to this madness. So just follow along with me and I will take you to the promised land. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know if there's any other uh, questions um, people are having. Um, I don't... See, some people, I'm just reading here the comments, people, some people saying they like the music, some people say they don't. So um, uh, that's that's the, the problem. <laughs> I mean, maybe I should, I can do a poll maybe next uh, next episode and we'll, we'll see. Okay, everybody. So enjoy the, the couple days off between our next class. Um, if you don't already have a white and a black, um, maybe you just have your six colors, then you want to go out and get a couple of these that you can use because um, we're going to be using them, we're going to be mixing them. And yikes, um, pulling my cord. Actually, the reason why I had this out here the whole time is just lastly, I thought I could use this to. see if we can kind of just quickly again the colors aren't going to show up very well but you know if you're even looking at a rainbow you can start to try to find the warm and cool areas of the rainbow right so up top here this darker area this would be our ultramarine blue so this is our warm color as it's moving towards the green it's going to cross into the cool blue and now we've got cool blue right here. And we know it's cool blue because the green is right next to it. As it's transitioning into the yellow, cool, cool. And then here's again like that peak of the mountain where it's, is it warm or cool? We're right in the middle. Got cool yellow and then warm yellow, right? Warm yellow into a warm red. And then we're transitioning from warm red into cool red. And then we've got cool red here. And then as we go into this violet purple, it starts to get warm and then it loops around back to this side. All right, so just uh, what I would say over the course of the next week is to try to see if you can see 
the warm and cool temperatures and color. Now, things get complicated when we add value to the color, when we add black and white to the color. So we'll talk about that next week and how color, those different color temperatures are affected by white and black. But uh, anyway, I could go on and on about all this stuff because I love it. It's, I think it's super neat. And it's also radically changed and improved my paintings after having understood these concepts. So um, we will see you in a couple of days. Thanks again for tuning in. Like, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Thank you so much for viewing. I hope to see you again on the next episode. Take care, everybody.